soon to be St. John Henry Newman's, at the moment, Blessed John Henry Newman's Church. We think October 13th, for those of you who are planning your fall travel, join us, we're told, by the travel agents who apparently know everything about when canonizations will occur, but that's, that's the date in Rome. I'm Father Bill Daly, I direct the Notre Dame Newman Center for Faith and Reason, and we're pleased, along with the Iona Institute, to sponsor tonight's talk. It's rare that we see this church so filled with eager faces, so I want to be clear, the Sugar Club is up the street. Um, I don't know what they have on tonight. This is a talk about St. Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell. Um, we're delighted you're all here for it. Uh, of course, we celebrated the Feast of St. Thomas More this past Saturday, so uh, it's a very timely occasion to gather and to think about that. And if that weren't reason enough, today's gospel reminds us that uh, narrow is the gate that leads to life and broad the path that leads to perdition, which might have been another talk for, or another title for tonight's talk, although I don't want to take Professor Rex's steam, and I don't actually know what he's going to say. Um, a bit of housekeeping, just in case anything untoward were to happen uh, with our physical facility. These lights uh, denote our exits to the laneway and to get out, as you can, of course, come out, uh, exit as well through the main entrance into which you entered uh, our wonderful church. It's always great to collaborate with the Iona Institute. Uh, they do so much uh, wonderful work uh, to provoke our thinking about the times in which we live and about eternal values and uh, to focus us on the things that are most important in life. And so we're always happy to cooperate with them and to host the occasional event with them here and elsewhere. And so with that, um, I must decrease and David Quinn of the Ione Institute must increase. Uh, thanks, Father Bill, and thank you for helping to facilitate tonight, and thank you for all for coming, and it's fantastic to see such a good crowd at the end of June um, on a topic such as this, and it just goes to show you how topical Thomas More and Cromwell remain centuries after they have died, and I think part of the reason is probably um, Hilary Mantel in recent times. Um, and the first time I came across our speaker tonight, Professor Richard Rex, was he gave it um, in Belfast towards the end of 2015, and he gave a talk um, broadly on the same topic. And uh, actually, the series Wolf Hall had just um, been aired a few months before um, on the BBC. I don't know how many of you recall that. I did the lazier thing of watching the series, not reading the two books. Um, and the third book in the series is due out, I think, um, next year. Um, but the two figures obviously remain very topical, and the two of them have been recruited in their different ways into some very modern battles. And um, I don't want to anticipate too much of what Richard is going to say, but um, Thomas Cromwell seems now to have been recruited as a kind of Guardian type columnist um, or a, a, you know, a BBC guest, um, and is very much now presented as a kind of very modern liberal secular, or at least a precursor to all those sort of things and now set against Moore, who has been presented by Mantel, obviously, as a villain. So she obviously felt reason to do that and to talk about him in the context of the, ver of the various present battles today. Um, so Richard Rex is a fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge, where he is Director of Studies in uh, Theological and Religious Studies. Um, and to give the shorthand version, he is one of the world's leading experts today on the Reformation era, certainly in the English-speaking world. Um, his popular survey of the Tudors was recently reissued as Tudors, the Illustrated History. He has also written books on Henry VIII and the English Reformation and on the Lollards, who, which apparently caused great controversy in those circles. It was a movement that I think would be described as a precursor to the Reformation. Would that be fair enough? And of course, his topic tonight is Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell. So now I will decrease so Professor Rex can increase. And thank you. I've been asked to uh, clip this microphone to my lapel. Thank you very much to David and to Father Bill and to, uh, for inviting me over to your fair city. This is only my second visit to Ireland and my first to Dublin. It seems that I only come to Ireland to talk about Hilary Mantel. <laughs> I believe that there are better reasons 
Before I begin, actually, I'd just like to say that if, uh, uh, just a, a moment of a sort of piety, because I, I stand before you as, a, as an academic from the University of Cambridge, an Englishman through and through, which means there must be some drop of Irish there somewhere. Uh, but I'm here, actually one of the reasons I'm here is because of a very good and wise man of whom some of you may have heard, Father Brendan Bradshaw, a scholar and a priest who for many years was the Director of Studies in History at Queen's College, Cambridge, and who many years ago now encouraged me in what might at the time have seemed a foolish ambition to return to university and to study for a PhD. And if it hadn't been for the encouragement of that man, I would have remained cloistered in the English civil service to the end of my days. So tomorrow I'll be popping over to Glasnevin Cemetery to visit his grave where he was recently laid to rest. And if you care for these things, you might say a prayer, not that he needs it for his soul. The two Thomases, Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell. It is possible to talk about Thomas More without talking about Thomas Cromwell but it has proven impossible to talk about Thomas Cromwell without talking about Thomas More. They are two of the emblematic figures of English history, so it's interesting that so many of you have turned out tonight to, to hear about that. More the defender of the Catholic Church in England against the tyrannical pretensions of Henry VIII. Cromwell, the pliant instrument of that tyranny. Robert Bolt's Man for All Seasons cast Moore as a liberal hero of freedom of conscience, and Cromwell as the ruthless agent of state pragmatism. Hilary Mantle's Wolf Hall has reversed those polarities for our age, with Cromwell now the apostle of a humane tolerance, and Moore the hate-filled prophet of religious fanaticism. My aim this evening is to investigate and document this reversal, to show how it was achieved, and to speculate on why it's enjoyed such success. The key to this, I think, is the idea that Moore and Cromwell have, in a rather specialised cultural niche, served to embody or represent the changing position of the Catholic Church in modern, or perhaps better, postmodern culture. But before we come to that, we must unpack this reversal. The reversal is essentially the achievement, as David has already said, of a single work of fiction, Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. Wolf Hall retold in the form of a novel the true story of the rise to supreme power under Henry VIII of the low-born Thomas Cromwell, a gifted, talent, uh, sorry, a gifted fixer, talent spotted by Cardinal Wolsey and catapulted into the highest levels of politics by the complex circumstances of Wolsey's fall. Cromwell's rise was bound up with Henry VIII's search for a divorce from Catherine of Aragon and a marriage, as you all know, to Anne Boleyn his newly beloved. Wolsey's failure to deliver this divorce after two years of desperate politicking led to his fall in 1529, and Cromwell might have fallen with him, but despite, or perhaps because, of displaying remarkable loyalty to his former master, he somehow managed to squirm out from beneath the collapse and attach himself directly to the king, whose, well, chief of staff he became for the next 10 years. Poor boy makes good against all odds is a classic plot, and many people found Wolf Hall a compelling read. Awarded the Booker Prize in 2009, it was unusually successful even for a Booker winner, not just reviewed in the classier weeklies, but actually sold and read in huge numbers. The reason for the enormous attention it generated even before the prize is obvious when you go back, as I did a few years ago, to read the reports and the reviews and the interviews published at the time and soon after. And here we have to take a little detour. For from that evidence from 10 years ago, according to its author, Wolf Hall was originally conceived as a single novel retelling the rise and fall of its hero. So Cromwell was just going to be one novel. But as Mantle got to grips with the events of 1534-35, in which Thomas More was targeted and ultimately destroyed by Henry's regime 
for his refusal to go along with Henry's policies, she found the duel between Moore and Cromwell irresistibly dramatic. One sees her point. This duel became the dominant theme of her narrative and reached a natural end in Moore's execution. And she had, as it were, to expand her plan from a novel and recast it as a trilogy just in order to make room for Thomas More. The trilogy then was recast to close each volume with a beheading. Moore in 35, Anne Boleyn in 36 to end, bring up the bodies and presumably in the final volume, now promised, if that's the word I want, for next year, Cromwell himself in 1540. But my point here is to note what actually happened. Thomas More changed the plot. In a sense, he took over the story, despite his allotted role as a merely secondary presence in it. Crucially, it was, I think, the portrayal of More and not of Cromwell, which actually accounts for the initial popularity of Wolf Hall. For in Wolf Hall, as David has again said, and you might as well have given the talk, really, as David has said, it is More who is the villain and Cromwell who is the hero, reversing not only an enduring tradition, but also that powerful dramatic portrayal of the two men in Bolt's Man for All Seasons. You'll remember Paul Schofield in the title role, which he reprised in the film from the original Broadway performances. Bolt's Moore was a hero of the liberal individual conscience, refusing to bend before tyranny. He was a hero for the Cold War. The resonance of his stand against Henry VIII echoed in the gulags of the Soviet Empire and amid the terrors of the Cultural Revolution. And if Bolt's individualist interpretation of Moore is not fully authentic to the man's own commitment to the collective and divinely guaranteed wisdom of the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, his portrayal of the man as a whole is reasonably faithful to his core values, truth, justice, peace, the rule of law. And Bolt's Moore was never unquestioned. There were those who challenged the picture, but he held sway over the general imagination of the English-speaking world from the 1960s until the start of this millennium. What struck most early reviewers most about Wolf Hall was that precisely that it stood this image of Moore on its head and that it appeared to do so with the full authority of the historical record properly interpreted. There's a granular detail to Mantle's narrative. One mustn't underestimate the level of a certain kind of historical research that she put into the work. I mean, it is you know, admirable. There's a, a granular detail of the narrative, the author's own earnest asseverations of the level of historical research she put into it, endowed this novel with an almost professional academic status. And Mantell herself reveled in this. She loved to quote a question one interviewer asked of her, apparently. Why do you make such a fetish of historical accuracy? When her novel was being adapted for the stage, she tells us, it was, I quote, her deep understanding of character and history that proved invalu invaluable to Mike Poulton, the writer who did the job. This understanding, she tells us again, enabled her to offer him great advice. Oh, well, actually, Thomas More can't possibly say this line, but Stephen Gardner can. You know, the basic question is not, did they say this, but could they have thought this? I think that's what you use as a guide. She really bulks up her historical status. As one star-struck commentator remarked, she checked every fact, every source, every date, every letter, every name. Her Cromwell books are a combination of wild imagining and unimpeachable accuracy. Well, one could sum this up again in more words of Mantle herself. The novelist has a responsibility to adhere to the facts as closely as possible. And if they're inconvenient, well, that's where the art comes in. You must work with the intractable facts and find the dramatic, the dramatic shape inside them. Forgive me for laboring this point about the purportedly historical status of this novel, but it was crucial, as I hope I've indicated at least, to its early vogue. And it should be noted that since certain criticisms have got rather more traction, 
the author has rowed back from some of those early claims. These days, she tends to emphasize rather more poetic license and the status of her works as fiction. But that is a change of position. At the time, the author knew what she was about. In 2015, she observed that some people have seen the novel as an outrageous attack on the reputation of Thomas More and as a travesty of the facts. But the truth is, she went on with unintentional irony, I think, that I have not discovered anything new about Thomas More. Well, no, she hadn't actually, but not in quite the way she meant. Her claim is to have depicted him from the point of view of the London evangelical, that is to say the early London Protestant community of the 1530s. Actually, I'd say the point of view of Thomas More that she adopts is closer to 21st century Islington coffee bar than it is to a 16th century London alehouse. Anyway, the Thomas More of Wolf Hall is first introduced to us in that novel by Thomas Cromwell as, quote, some sort of failed priest, a frustrated preacher. And this is a, a harbinger of what follows, a procession of slipshod second-hand scholarship, long-range psychoanalysis, and mere character assassination. For Mantell has not made this stuff up herself. The notion, first put about by a modern biographer of Moore, a man called Richard Marius back in around 1980, the notion that Moore had in his youth seriously considered a vocation to the priesthood has barely any basis in the original evidence. Moore did spend a few years living a life of devotion without a vow, without a vow, in the London Charter House. Perhaps he was meditating the religious life, though the very fact that he went for several years without taking a vow, to my mind, rather suggests not. Marius made this episode, the single episode, the linchpin of his view of Moore, linking it with Moore's alleged obsession with excrement and sex, to paint a picture of a warped psyche tormented by sexual temptation and frustration. Now, this is actually all nonsense. Moore's sole recourse to coprology, it's a sort of fancy Greek word for talking about dung, Moore's sole recourse to coprology, I would in other contexts perhaps be more vigorous in my choice of words, but not here, in his voluminous polemical writings, is to take up one single passage of Luther and to, metaphorically, throw it back at him. And his alleged obsession with sex comes down actually to his very frequent harping on Luther's breach of his vow of celibacy through his marriage to Katharina von Bora, a self-conscious rhetorical tactic which Moore himself refers to quite literally as harping on it. He does it deliberately because he knows it's a good story. A member of the clergy in bed with a member of the opposite sex was as funny in the 16th century as it can be today. But even the basic idea that Moore toyed with the religious life or the priesthood is still words away from that grey and green concept of the failed priest, which Mantell here infuses into Cromwell's mind over a gap of 450 years. Well, the Wolf Hall Moore, I won't go on too long, is allowed no redeeming features. And history is not so much interpreted, as the author claims, as ruthlessly rewritten to this end. Let's take an example. His life of personal mortification is transmuted into hypocritical vanity. Well, perhaps that's just interpretation. No. Cromwell, of course, knows all. Under his clothes, he tells us of more, it is well known. More wears a jerkin of horsehair. Jerkin. Sorry, it's kind of amateur. The jerkin is an outer garment, no sleeves made of leather. It's kind of, you know, often worn as a semi-form of armour. Uh, you, you couldn't have a jerkin of hair. And, and if you did, it couldn't go under your clothes. But the phrase at the time was a shirt of hair. Even the phrase hair shirt is later than Tudor England. The chief use of the word jerkin, it's just worth commenting on since 1800, check the Oxford English Dictionary, has been as a word used by the kind of more ham-fisted breed of historical novelist to tell you that the action is taking place in the past. You know, don't say jer jacket, say jerkin, it sounds more authentic. But anyway, sorry, the evidence we have 
is that Moore's hair shirt was a closely guarded secret, known only to his confessor, his wife, and his daughters, or probably only one of those daughters. But, but why, spoil a good li why spoil a good libel? The most peculiar feature of the legislation of England during the 1530s, to take another point, the Cromwellian decade, was something called an Act of Attainder. This was a parliamentary statute, parliament was a thing in those days, which had formerly been used to define the punishment of convicted traitors or notorious rebels. Under Cromwell, a new use was found for it. Attainder was used by Cromwell to bypass judicial process and simply declare specified individuals guilty of treason. It's an amazing idea. Attainder of this kind was simply unknown before 1534 and unrepeated after 1540, except for a single revival in 1641 to cut off the head of the Earl of Strafford, who must one day, as Thomas Wentworth have in the past, strutted his way around uh, this very area. Yet even this unique instrument of Cromwellian tyranny is fathered onto Thomas More by Mantell's Cromwell, who in a conversation with More in the novel justifies his own use of the expedient with the rebuke, come on, you'd have seen them off that way yourself when you were Chancellor. I mean, never mind that he didn't. Uh, and all More is given to answer is, you may be right. No, nonsense. But the most ludicrous fruits of the five years of research that produced Wolf Hall are saved for the final act. When Thomas More is immured in the Tower of London, cut off from the world, closely watched, closely guarded, his agents, his agent? His agents, we're told, just listen to that, his agents are busy in Antwerp hunting down the refugee Bible translator, William Tyndale. Moore has a sticky web in Europe still, a web made of money, says, oh, the mastery of Mantel's prose. In early 1535, when all his assets have been confiscated to the king by an act of attainder, incidentally, passed against him, when his wife is writing to the king, begging for some financial assistance, Moore is somehow financing and masterminding from captivity an international plot to capture a renegade Englishman on the other side of the channel. I mean, if he could have done that, he'd been running the world. Shortly before his trial, this Moore lets Thomas Cromwell know that he has heard rumours of Tyndale's arrest and asks for further details. But Cromwell gives him nothing, telling the reader in an aside that Tyndale had indeed been betrayed by someone adding significantly, and more knows who. Now, the bizarre notion that a man shut up in the Tower of London was able, like some Tudor Moriarty or perhaps some Tudor McCavity, to mastermind a conspiracy against a religious refugee on the other side of the North Sea is not, as you might think, the fanciful fruit of some novelist's perfervid imagination. It's only fair to say at this point that I found nothing in Wolf Hall to suggest that it also has that kind of imaginative power. What this notion tells us is what research actually means in relation to this book, because the source of this idea is a 2002 biography of Tyndale by the late journalist Brian Moynihan. I don't know, did, did you ever meet him? No, no. Moynihan promenades this idea as his personal discovery, and I have to say I know no reason to deny him this dubious credit. But, and you have to follow the argument very closely here, okay? Moynihan offers not one single solitary shred of evidence for his claim. I'm sorry if that was a bit complicated. <laughs> the best he could do was to pick up a rumor circulating at the time that some unspecified English bishops were behind Tyndale's arrest. Okay. I mean, there's no evidence to substantiate those rumours, but and the intellectual processes that enabled a journalist to leap from rumours about a bishops to claims about an imprisoned layman, well, maybe David could tell us how a journalist could do that. I, as a mere historian, I have to say I find it beyond my powers. <laughs> 
In Wolf Hall, then, anything that's ever been said at any time to the discredit of Moore is grist to the mill, while anything that ever said in his favour is passed over in silence or simply denied. The social conscience of the author of Utopia, nowhere to be seen, though Thomas Cromwell is reported as feeling that people ought to be given better jobs. I am very thoughtful of him. Moore's notorious sense of humour, his jokes are all, it transpires, stolen from his father. His own humour, such as it is, is merely cruel and hurtful. His devotion to the family, celebrated in Holbein's glorious group portrait and in Erasmus's biographical sketch, gone. Mantlesmore has no love for his wife and was frankly a misogynist who routinely insults and humiliates his wife and is, of course, disliked by her. The fact that Moore gave his daughters the kind of academic education usually reserved, well, almost always reserved for boys in Tudor England, it's mentioned. But only so that Cromwell's daughter, eager to learn, can ask why Moore's daughter should be the only girl to have such a privilege. As for the allegations that Moore tortured suspected heretics, these are dinned into the reader's ears incessantly. His own printed refutation of these allegations is not so much as hinted at. Thus far more. What about Cromwell? Well, the characterization of our hero is entirely opposite. For the Cromwell of Wolf Hall is a most curious creation. Above all, he's nice. Niceness is, of course, the nearest that our banal era can get to virtue. And so Cromwell is very nice. Although he is tough and hard and may even have killed a man, he's still nice and is at heart non-violent. I owe this one to Colin. I gave up fighting, he tells us loftily, because when I lived in Florence, I looked at frescoes every day. I was going to say you couldn't make it up, but obviously somebody did. But it's... <laughs> Yes, Cromwell too was an expat in Chiantishire, like so many of Wolf Hall's readers. Let's just, let's just recall the author's own observation. The basic question, she reminds us, is not did they say this, but could they have thought this? Nobody but nobody in the 16th century could have responded in that way to frescoes. That just wasn't what art was for. Art in the 16th century is, look at that, you can see how much money that cost. That's the point of art in the 16th century. I mean, it, it developed some other aspects at that time, but that is the driving force. But the niceness is relentless. Cromwell recalls from his boyhood seeing a heretic burned alive. The crowd cheered, but not Cromwell, who alone felt pity for her fate. Of course, he has no time for astrologers or alchemists, and he's so kind to prisoners. He calls by to make sure that a jailed Protestant is being properly looked after in the Tower of London. He even pops in to see the Holy Maid of Kent, a sort of visionary nun who was the figurehead of popular opposition to Henry in the early 1530s. You are fed properly, aren't you? He asks solicitously before having her said to have her head cut off. He considers threatening Thomas More with a lingering death, only considers it because of course, Moore is a weakling and a coward. He can't even take Cromwell's manly handshake without flinching. But Cromwell won't sink so low. He knows he will not do it. The notion is contaminating. He's so much nicer, you see, than that nasty Mr. Moore. And in case we balk at taking Cromwell's own unsupported word for his niceness, it's endorsed in the novel by Moore's son-in-law, William Roper, who ruefully assures Cromwell, we know you are not vengeful, sir. Though God knows he, more has never been a friend to your friends. Please. Cromwell's attitudes are impeccably modern. And of course, this is what helped endear the book to the Book of Judges in 2009. Moore's attitudes, anything but. His inevitable anti-Semitism is introduced casually. Still serving your Hebrew God, I see, he remarks in passing to Cromwell, adding, presumably for our benefit, because otherwise we won't get the point, I mean your idol, usury. So Moore is made to invoke this classic anti-Semitic stereotype. Now, there's no reason to think that Moore's attitude to Jews was any more or any less favorable than those of his English contemporaries. But the implied contrast with Cromwell is of course delivered. Once Cromwell is master of the rolls, he gets to live in a place called the Rolls House, 
in Chancery Lane. And at one time, that Rolls House, back in the Middle Ages, had been the hostel for Jewish converts to Christianity, before, of course, the Jews were cruelly expelled from England in the late 13th century. Cromwell's kindly heart brims over with fellow feeling for those who once lived within these walls, flinching from the Londoners outside. And so it goes on and on. Cromwell has a good-natured contempt for superstition and for the priesthood, though for reasons that are never made entirely clear, his essentially sceptical temperament stands alongside some kind of scriptural Protestantism. He avails himself of 20th century psychological insights to explain his contemporaries. And finally, this is my personal favorite, he has reservations about hunting. <laughs> and not, we are told, like Thomas More, because he thinks it barbaric. None of More's nasty judgmental moralizing, of course. But as far as one can make out, because it's driven some species of larger mammals to extinction. <laughs> How can he put it? In some countries, they hunt the bear and the wolf and the wild boar. We once had those animals in England when we had our great forests. So it's not just the furry animals he wants to hug, it's the trees as well. This guy wouldn't be out of place on the high street in Islington with a skinny latte and an iPhone, having a chat, having a chat to Jeremy. Jeremy Corbyn, of course. <laughs> but surely it's only a novel. What harm can it do? Can't I tell the difference between fiction and history? Well, yes, I can. But that's the point. I do this for a living, as Michael Caine says in the film. Lots of people can't, and that's where the harm lies, especially in a literary project whose author claims to make a fetish of historical accuracy and who blurs the boundary between the two to an extent that not even a professional historian will be able to tell them apart unless, like me, they happen to be a specialist in the period. As my friend Colin here tonight once told me, literate people today derive a surprisingly large proportion of their knowledge of and notions about the world from fiction. Perhaps these days more from films than from books, as was once the case. But when a book or a TV series presents an essentially historical narrative bolstered with a remarkably well-researched body of circumstantial detail, but characterized by wild misrepresentation and grotesque anachronism. It will misinform and it will mislead. And at that point, the historian has a right or perhaps better a duty to intervene. Now, as one reviewer of Wolf Hall put it, you can't back Cromwell without spitting on more. Well, if you can't back Cromwell without spitting on more, can you back more without spitting on Cromwell? Well, you certainly can't back both horses, that's for certain. But you can esteem and praise more, even making room for appropriate criticism, without actually having to take Cromwell into account at all. Bolt and Mantell once again offer an intriguing contrast. In A Man for All Seasons, Cromwell is definitely down among the minor characters in the credits and on the dramatis personae. But in Wolf Hall, Thomas More is central. He's actually the man the book's about. And this imbalance reflects reality despite authorial intention. See, Thomas More actually has never been forgotten. People fell over themselves in the 16th century to write his biography, even in the Tudor era even at, as it were, the lowest point of his reputation. The biographies by William Roper, Nicholas Harpsfield, and Thomas Stapleton all survive. The one that was written by William Rastall survives in a few stray fragments. It was probably the best of all of them, judging by what survives. There have been more editions of William Roper's Life of More across the centuries than there have been biographies of Cromwell by all authors put together. Not a century has gone by without biographies of More. No one rushed to write the life of Cromwell. The only early account is in Fox's Book of Martyrs in 1563. To be fair, a book endlessly reprinted, but not, I think, because of the story of Cromwell. Probably more Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley, I feel. It would be stretching, you know, for all Fox's efforts, no one would take Cromwell seriously as a martyr. 
But it's perhaps the relative fate of the two men in London that is most revealing. Both men were Londoners. And as Peter Ackroyd noted in his excellent 1998 biography of Moore, despite the best efforts of Henry VIII to suppress his memory, Moore, Henry VIII tries to destroy the very memory of Moore. Yet his fellow Londoners never forgot him. Despite his Catholicism, even Protestant London venerated his memory. Cromwell was simply forgotten. There is no collection of Cromwell memorabilia to match the Moriana that is still treasured now at Stonyhurst. John Stripe, the indefatigable Stuart historian of the early Church of England, saw no reason to have a life of Cromwell alongside his lives of Cranmer and Parker and other early figures. For centuries, there was nothing other than a little bit in John Fox, apart from one attempt, a brave attempt, at a historical play published you know, the tragical history of Thomas Cromwell, published in 1602 with a deliberately misleading claim on the title page. It says, by Mr. W.S. Yes, early Stuart readers were meant to think it was Shakespeare, but even they weren't fooled. It was not included, this play was not included in the early folio editions, and later on it's only ever included in collections of Shakespeare as a known spurious work. It's never been mistaken for the master. Apart from that one play, clearly a bit of a clunker, there was barely a whisper of Cromwell until 1887. That's the first life of Cromwell ever published. Because Cromwell wasn't rediscovered until the 19th century when the archives of English history were first properly opened to scholars. Before the work of a, a great Tudor historian, Geoffrey Elton, in the 1950s, there was a grand total of three biographies of Cromwell had been written, none of them incidentally any good. Between Elton in the 1950s and Mantle in 2009, there were another four biographies. None of them were any good either, by the way. Since Wolf Hall, there have been five, an unparalleled rush of Cromwell biography, culminating at last in something that's pretty good, Dermot McCulloch's definitive Thomas Cromwell, A Life, which came out last year. Now, it's worth talking about these historians for a minute or two. It was Geoffrey Elton in the 1950s, a name, not a name to conjure with probably for most of you, but a great Cambridge historian called Geoffrey Elton, who put Thomas Cromwell back on the historical map after four centuries of obscurity. No Elton, no mantle. In the 1950s, Elton offered Thomas Cromwell as the pioneer of cabinet government and the architect of modern Britain via what he called a Tudor revolution in government, which in less than a decade transformed a ramshackle medieval monarchy into a modern nation state. It's fair to say that on the whole, historians have not bought into that narrative. In the 1970s, Elton actually had a second go trying to reinvent Cromwell, this time as a statesman dedicated to the common wheel, a sort of forerunner of the welfare policies of the post-war consensus. But that one didn't run too well either. What Elton did realise, or where he pioneered, was the difficulty of presenting Cromwell as a hero when he was so closely implicated in the destruction of Moore. And in addition, he personally resented Bolt's portrayal of Moore as an advocate of the rights of the individual conscience, which is you know, a, a misinterpretation. But the need to correct that misrepresentation lured him into a sort of visceral hostility to Moore, which led him in turn to take up Richard Marius's bizarre psychosexual character interpretation in the 1980s. So it's actually the Cromwell of Geoffrey Elton and of Richard Marius who is the basis of the Cromwell of Hilary Mantle. And in turn, no Mantle, no McCulloch. I very much doubt whether, had Hilary Mantle not dragged Cromwell back into the public eye, whether Dermot McCulloch would actually have embarked on his monumental study. Now, this recent biography of Cromwell is a professional triumph. It's one of the most technically accomplished Tudor historians of our age, McCulloch has no trouble in disentangling the details of Cromwell's life and work. Gone is Mantle's hopelessly anachronistic idealization. Gone, too, is Elton's proto-modern statesman. McCulloch shows us a Cromwell who is a master of court politics, a fixer who made himself and his relatives stupendously wealthy by ensuring that Henry VIII got exactly what he wanted.
Yet the human being who emerges from this biography is tragically empty. McCulloch's Cromwell is still like Mantle's, a poor boy made good, but he didn't do good. McCulloch does his best, but the raw material just ain't there. The most he can say is that Cromwell cared for his children. Well, that's good to know, but it's, it's not exactly a justification of a life well lived for a statesman in the public sphere. He rightly emphasizes that Cromwell was a Protestant, but he misses the essential instrumentality of Cromwell's Protestantism, a faith Cromwell saw simply as a buttress for royal power. Of course, Cromwell couldn't possibly be the liberal skeptic of Mantell's novel. There were no atheists within, as it were, the swing of Henry's axe. But Cromwell put the other world entirely at the disposal of this. He was a destroyer, not a creator. He set about destroying institutions, traditions, people, anything that got in the way. And it's this I think about him that appeals to our age, in particular because of his destruction of Catholicism, which he saw quite rightly, and far more clearly than poor old confused Henry, as the opposite of Henry's supremacy. This I think is why, to some extent, he appeals to McCulloch, why he appeals to Mantel, why he appeals to so many of her readers. Cromwell then has only recently become interesting. That's something you have to remember. You know, 50 years ago, really most people hadn't heard of him at all. More has always been interesting. And we should pay attention to this rather simple history lesson. So why has this reversal of reality gained such traction? Well, my answer to that is brief and in the Peggyan sense, mystical rather than rigorously logical. It's all to do with Moore's unquestioned place as a martyr for the Catholic Church and the swelling tide of resentment in the last 30 years against the Christian and in particular the Catholic past that created and sustained Europe over the last 1500 years. Next year sees the centenary of one of Hilary Belloc's most important books, Europe and the Faith in which he delivered himself of one of his most trenchant observations. Belloc was a man for whom trenchant observations were, as it were, everyday comments. The faith is Europe. Europe is the faith. Now, because Belloc was a Catholic, his claim is often assumed to have been some sort of claim about Catholicism, as some sort of colonialist, colonialist claptrap, as if he thought that Catholicism must be European. That's not what he's saying at all. His book's a book about Europe. He was talking about Europe and his claim was about Europe and its essence. Without Christianity, he is arguing, Europe is nothing more than a geographical expression. It's difficult to define Hilary Belloc, but perhaps the easiest way to sum him up is to say that he was a prophet. He believed fervently in Europe, but he was no dunderheaded triumphalist. He saw our times coming both the relentless rise of materialist paganism and the resurgence of Islam, a culture for which he had immense respect. What's that got to do with our two Thomases? Well, as our Europe and our Britain, my Britain, your Ireland, as they don't so much loosen their grasp on their traditional Christian culture as thrust it from them with revulsion and disdain, Cromwell and Moore symbolize the spiritual struggle of our times, both in their historical reality and in the distorting mirror of Mantle's fiction. Cromwell must destroy Moore if you are on Mantle's side of this debate. Cromwell must destroy Moore. As Denzel Washington says in his title role in The Equalizer 2014, old man's got to be the old man, fish's got to be the fish. You've got to be who you are in this world no matter what. Cromwell has to destroy more. To destroy more, the symbol of Catholicism more must be diminished to the scale of an ant so that Cromwell may trample upon him. Moore's metaphor, remember. Mantell's fiction shows us a nasty man getting his Tudor comeuppance. History shows us something different. But truth is about proportion. And getting things in proportion is about getting the big picture. Don't worry, I'm just about to finish. And in the case of Cromwell and Moore, 
the big pictures are there for us to see. They can be seen in the Frick Collection in New York, where Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell gaze at each other across a fireplace. I've only seen the pictures of the pictures. I've never been to New York. They gaze at each other across the fireplace, captured by the hand of the 16th century's greatest portraitist, Hans Holbein the Younger. The author of Wolf Hall herself describes Holbein's picture of Cromwell as an incredibly dead picture. This is Cromwell's most fervent living admirer, okay? And she's right. You know, you look at that picture, <laughs> you're not meant to like him. The art critic Waldemar Januszak rather more memorably labels Cromwell as the least attractive sitter in the whole of Holbein's art. The picture is the evidence. Pictura poesis. A great painter, they say, paints not the face, but the soul. Holbein's Moor is famously and sublimely living. This is the evidence. The big picture. Cromwell, dead, dull, more alive, alert. Holbein got it. Seeing is believing. But there's none so blind as them that will not see. Thank you.